If you would take your Bibles with me, we're going to start in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 27, Matthew chapter 27 and verse 27 and going on to verse 31. It says, then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they sped on him took a reed and struck it struck him on the head and when he and when they had mocked him they took the robe off of him put on uh, put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified I want to pause here for just a moment it's amazing to read such a story isn't it as we read the crucifixion of Christ we read about all the horrible things that he went through all the terrible things they did to him the mockery just absolute horrendous behavior to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we ask ourselves, why? Well, the truth is that when you start getting into the Scripture, the Scripture divides people into two camps. You have the camp that is the world and the camp which is the church, the redeemed of God. And here Christ was sacrificing himself as a lamb led to the slaughter that we, the church, may be redeemed. That those who call on his name could come and be a part of his family. But to those who rejected Christ, the world, they behaved just as the world does. And they mocked him. And they beat him. The love of God is demonstrated in this that while they're beating and they're mocking Christ, he still goes to the cross anyway. I remember I asked my, my wife, or I, I had a discussion with my wife earlier this week. I said, you know, I said, it's interesting to me that when we look in Scripture, Christ told us it would be this way. He didn't hide it from us. He told us from the very beginning, and He said it would never change. As a matter of fact, if you hold your place here in the book of Matthew and go to John chapter 15, hold your place here because we are going to come back. But in John chapter 15, in verse 18, it tells us, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of this world, but I chose you out of this world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the, remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep your word also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If they had come, if they had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. Listen to those words that Jesus says. And you say, well, yeah, the soldiers hated him. But look at what he said. He said the world. He didn't say an individual. He said the world. Why? Because he's noticing that demons are active even in this world. They're affecting those who listen and who who reject the word of God, the teachings of God, and give themselves over to debauchery and the things of this world. God says, these hate me. And because they hate me, they will hate you also. Now God tells us, He says, I'm greater than the world. Have faith in me. Walk with me. But we shouldn't be surprised when we see how the world acts towards our faith or other Christians. I saw on the news just this week the absolute abomination that took place over the Olympics. The sheer mockery of the Last Supper of Jesus Christ. This is demonic activity in its purest form. We see this and we should not be surprised because the world acts exactly how the world acts. But we as Christians are to be different. We're to have our faith in Jesus Christ. And he tells us as our faith in Jesus Christ, we're going to look different. We're going to be different from the world. This shocks many people because for years we've thought that we could somehow find a middle ground with the world around us. There is no middle ground in Jesus Christ. He tells us in his word, you're either for me or you're against me. One of the two. You can't straddle the fence. 
we're seeing today exactly what the world is. And we saw it again at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. When he surrendered himself as a lamb for the sake of you and I, the world hated him without cause. Without cause they hated him. Think about it for just a moment. The world for years has told us that Jesus does not exist. Why is it so important that they mock Jesus Christ? Throughout, throughout all of our lives, they've told us that it's fantasy. It's fiction. It doesn't exist. But somehow they cannot stand the Lord Jesus Christ. Here Jesus is going to the cross. He's done nothing wrong. He preached the power of God, the gospel. And they hated him with such disdain that here the soldiers mock him. They drive a crown of thorns onto his head. They don't lay it on, they drive it on with a reed. Blood's flowing from his face. He's been beaten. They continually mock him. And he still goes to the cross. Jesus tells us to follow his example. The world beat him. It did not change him. When we see the world acting in such a way, it should drive us to the point where we go down on our knees and we call out to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we start repenting of sins and get right with the Lord because the time is drawing close. Church, mark my words, there is coming a day when all those who mark, mock Christ will look up into the eastern sky and they'll see Him returning on the clouds of glory. They will see Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and they will mourn as one mourns for their only son, and they will realize the folly of their ways. But for you and I, we can't be sucked into the vortex of the world. We've got to be a people who are set apart, holy and righteous, following after the ways of God, going down on our knees, calling out on the name of the Lord Jesus, repenting of the sins in our lives, and get ready for the return of our beloved Jesus. As we go further in the Gospels, going back to Matthew 27 and reading on about this crucifixion of Christ, we go on to verse 37. And it says, And they put over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. The two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and the other on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads, and saying, you who destroy, destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priest also mocking with the scribes and elders said, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he is king of Israel, let him come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. This is the hatred of Jesus at the cross. This is the hatred they had for him. You're talking religious leaders. You're talking what we would call today preachers and teachers. You're talking about government leaders. You're talking about people who were just thieves and robbers, people who just did the things of the world, hating him as he died. But now this is where I get excited because this is where we see the love of Jesus. Because if you read the crucifixion in the book of Luke, it says that one of the robbers, one of them, turned to Jesus as he was near death. And he said, remember me. Remember me. They've been mocking him. They've been persecuting him. And the thief says, remember me. And Jesus, in absolute love and mercy that is beyond my comprehension, looks to the thief on the cross and he says, this day you will be with me in paradise. This is the beautiful message of the cross. It's a message of redemption. When we read in the Gospels, it tells us that the harvest is truly plentiful. The fields are white for harvest. Now you might ask the question, Pastor, how can you say that upon seeing all these abominations and things that are taking place? It's because everywhere I look, I see people searching for answers. 
everywhere I look, I see people clinging to things, trying to find an answer to the hardest questions that life has. They're grieving, they're hurting, they're angry, and they're lashing out. But they want an answer. I see the same thing in Scripture. I see Paul persecuting the Christians for zeal for God. It's not until God calls him on the road to Damascus, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He made him somebody different. Today, God is looking to make people different, but it starts somewhere. It starts right here with the church. The challenge for the church is if the righteous are scarcely saved, then where will the sinner and the ungodly appear? We must be ready, not only for the return of Jesus Christ, but to do the work of Jesus Christ. That means to spend time on our knees. Oh, church, if there's anything more powerful, I don't know what it is, to spend time down on our knees in prayer, begging God to do a holy work. You go on over to Romans chapter 1, and you start reading down in chapter 1, but you go on down to Romans, verse 1, or Romans chapter 1, verse 30, and it tells us all the different wicked things that are going to happen. But one of the things that it talks about are inventors of evil. People invent ways to be evil. My goodness, we read that, we think, how does that work? I see my kids inventing ways to get into trouble all the time. They invent ways. Things that I never thought. I have said so many sentences that I didn't think any person should ever have to say. I remember when Aiden was just a little boy, just a little bitty fella. He was playing out in the yard. Days later, days earlier, I should say, days earlier, I saw a stump in the yard, and it had all kind of bugs and insects on it. I thought, oh, I don't like that. So I sprayed the stump. I told Miranda, I said, I sprayed that stump, keep the kids away from it for a while. She goes, okay. About three, four days later, they're out there playing in the yard. They've played in a lot of times, never had any trouble. Miranda and I look over, and what do we see our son doing? He was licking the stump. Like, what are you doing? No, we rush him in. We pour water all over his tongue. We're wiping it out. He's a toddler. He has no idea what's going on. He thinks it's hilarious. We call poison control. Should we be worried? It's like, oh, no, he'll be fine. I think what parent has ever had to utter the words, don't lick the stump? I don't think any parents uttered those words. It's probably only me. And then I look at Romans 1, it says they will become inventors of evil. Why? Because they're angry. They're lashing out. But here when we read the crucifixion, God's love is still so great that if some of these people would just turn and repent of their sins, God can forgive them. But for you and I today, here's the challenge. This is the greater challenge for us. Get on your knees in prayer. Get right with God the Father. Get right with Him today. We are to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. How can I take Christ when I'm not carrying Him with me everywhere I go? Church, when we see such things on television, I'm going to tell you what we do. Turn it off. Not one Christian should be watching the Olympics this year to send a loud message to each and every one of them. This is not okay. This is not okay in Jesus Christ. This is not okay. We should not be watching that garbage. We should be letting them know that I love you and I love God, but that will not come into my home. It's just like my kids. When I saw that stump, I didn't bring it into my house to treat it. I sprayed it outside. It's staying outside. I couldn't keep my son from licking it. But I wasn't going to bring it in the house. Church, we are to keep ourselves holy and unspotted from the world so that just as Christ, that when the world persecutes us, we can still stand up and share a message of godliness with them. We cannot look like the world and act like the world and still share a gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to start coming out and being separate. God wants to forgive. God wants to love them. That was the purpose of the cross. But God forgave me of the sins. How dare I go back and bring sin back into my life and then try to turn around and share the gospel of Christ. I can't do that. I've got to die to one so I can live for the other. I've got to let one go so I can live for the other. God's going to judge wickedness, but I don't want to be caught up in that judgment. I want to be pulled away from it. I want to get away from it as far as I can, as fast as I can. 
so that I can still share the, with the world the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've got to keep myself unspotted from the world. That's what Jude t tells us about. If you go on over to Jude 12, it tells us that these are spots in your love feast. These are clouds without water. It's talking about people who say one thing and yet they do something completely different. We've got to be those people that come back and we do those righteous things that God has called us to do to be unspotted from the world. If you take your Bibles and you turn on over to Galatians in chapter 6, Galatians chapter 6 and going on to verse 9. Galatians chapter 6, starting in verse 6 and going to verse 9. It says, Let him who taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. This is the promise of God in His Holy Scripture. He tells us, number one, He says God's not going to be mocked. As I said in the beginning, there's coming a day where God's going to return. Every eye will see Jesus return. Every single eye will see Jesus come out of that eastern sky. And they will know exactly who He is on that day. There will be no question about it. God will not be mocked. But at the same time, in the same scripture, God challenges us. As believers in Jesus Christ, He challenges us. He tells us, do not grow weary. We look at the world, it can become wearisome sometimes. We see how the world's becoming more and more wicked. We think, how do I stay apart from it? How do I protect my family? Church, there's coming a point, and it's already here where we're going to have to start saying no to some things. We're going to have to start saying no. Keeping things out of our lives and out of our homes so that we can focus on our walk for Jesus Christ. So that we can be the testimony that God wants us to be. I tell my kids, I tell them constantly, they're growing up in a wicked world. I tell them, I say, guys, we can't do everything that everyone else does. There are certain things that we're going to say no to, and we're going to walk away. And they'll say, why? I'll say, because it's the right thing to do. And they'll ask me the question. They'll say, Dad, does that mean that other people are wicked? I tell them, say, son, sometimes people do bad things. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love them. But it also means that we're not going to be doing those things in our home. And that's what we need to be saying to each other. We need to start throwing some things out of our lives so that we can honor God more. Church, we're a special people. We're set apart. That's exactly, those are the very words of Scripture. We are a special people. We are set apart for the good works of God. If I don't look different than the rest of the world, then I've got to start asking the question, what am I doing? If I sound just like the world, I've got to ask myself, what testimony am I leaving? I've got to be different. I've got to be different than the rest of the world. One thing I love is you watch our daughter. Boy, she can be a pill sometimes. Little Elian, or little Adelaide buddy, she can scream. She sounds like a little Pentecostal baby at times. She can scream with the best of them. But you watch her when we pray. Just up here she did it. She puts her hands together. She bows her head. She knows it's time to pray. Not many kids do that, but she's learned it. I fold my hands and I bow my head because it's time to pray. We're to be different than the rest of the world. Jesus is coming. Let me ask you a simple question. Boy, it's a simple question, but it's a profound one. If today was the day that we heard the trumpet sound, would you be ready? Would you honestly be ready to go and be with Jesus if the trumpet were to sound today? You might tell me, say, Pastor, I, you know, you talk about Jesus and the trumpet sounding. I just don't see how that's possible. If you go on YouTube, National News carried it several years ago. This probably happened about four or five years ago. Look up uh, Trumpets Over Jerusalem. I believe that's how you'll find it. 
there's a ring up in the sky formed directly over Jerusalem. And trumpets started sounding all around Jerusalem that day. It was on national news. It was covered all around the globe. Videos of it all over YouTube. And that moment, Jesus could have come back. Boom. And we asked the question, would you have been ready? Would you have been ready had that been the time? God loves us. He gives us every opportunity to be saved. The question is, are we going to take it? The world is going to become more and more wicked. The abomination we saw at the Olympics this week is not even a touch of what the world is capable of doing in their wicked pursuit against God. Not even a beginning of it. But I'm not focused on how wicked the world can be. I'm more focused on how holy the church can be. We need to be holy for Jesus Christ. We need to be saying no to the ways of, of this world and yes to the ways of God. To be that people set apart to do good works for Jesus Christ. We go on further to the next, next verse. I want to I take you over to John 3.17 as we close out the music and start getting ready. But John 3.17, I'm going to quote it, but you could, you're more than welcome to look it up. It tells us, it says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through Him the world might be saved. That's John 3.17. John 3.17 tells us that God's purpose was not to simply condemn the wickedness of this world. That was not the purest intent. The intent was that the world, those who are lost, might be saved. The crucifixion is a perfect example of that. The thieves mocked Jesus. And in the end, one said, Lord, would you remember me? Would you remember me? One trick that Satan does to each and every person, he does this a lot in the church. He reminds us of all of our failures and the things we've done. And he says, you'll never measure up. You'll never measure up church I found out a long time ago I don't measure up I found out a long long time ago I don't measure up I am absolutely in every way shape and form I'm a thief on the cross but God told me that if I want to be holy in his sight I have to ask him to come into me to forgive me of my sins. And I've got to start walking for Him. And because I did that at the age of seven and have pursued it ever since, I'm holy in the sight of God. I have a past. God doesn't remember it. He doesn't remember it. He's let it go. His purpose was not to condemn me. His purpose was to save me. I don't want to be like the world. I want to be like Jesus. This is the stark contrast you saw this week. The contrast of the world and the church. The world is and has always been evil. The church is supposed to be different. We're supposed to be different. I was told years ago, years and years ago, I was told a pastor got up and he spoke and he said, the Christian army is the only army that shoots its wounded. He was saying that whenever a Christian falls short, we tend to pile on that Christian and make them feel ashamed. And we end up pushing them away. I'm here to tell you today, I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you've done. I don't want to know it. All I want you to do is to be right with Jesus. Come and talk to Him. Come lay it down at the foot of the cross. Be holy in the sight of God. You don't answer to man. You don't answer to me. You don't answer to this church. You don't answer to anybody else. You answer to God. The people this week, they will answer to God. As you and I will also answer. And we have a choice to either walk out these doors being the same person we were when we walked in, or we can walk out a different person in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17, powerful. If any man, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. 
the old things have passed away. Behold, all things are made new in Jesus. I tell you what, the church needs to get a hold of this one idea because it will change your life. Jesus is real. He is real. And He will return. That's not a question. It's a statement of fact. He is God. Jehovah. And He loves you. Ooh, how He loves you. There's nothing you can do to push that away. My daughter just this week. Oh, my kids. I get more sermon material off of my kids. She came over to me, had her arms extended wide, wanting to hold on to Daddy. I get down on my knees and I reach out my arms. I said, oh, sweetie, come to Daddy. And she comes and she wraps her arms around me real tight. And oh, she filled her britches. I picked her up. I said, sweetheart, we got to take care of some things here. You come with daddy. And I laid her down and I started cleaning her up. I'm talking to her. I said, oh, sweetheart, you're such a pretty little girl, aren't you? She's smiling ear to ear, giggling and laughing. She's throwing her legs every which way. I told her, I said, honey, hold on just one minute. We're not done yet. Hold on here. Daddy's got to get everything cleaned up. I get it all cleaned up. I put a good old dress on her. She's pretty as peaches. Oh, she's a pretty little girl. And I set her down on the floor. I said, you be feel better, honey? She had the biggest smile on her face. And she went running into the other room just rejoicing she's clean. For a Christian, I come down the center aisle. Oh, goodness me, I come down the center aisle. And I have my arms open wide. I say, oh, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I live in a dark and sinful place. Lord Jesus, I've done so many awful things. I need you. And I come running into his arms. And God looks at me and he says, I love you. I didn't come into this world to condemn you. I didn't come in this world to just throw you away. I love you. He says, oh, but we got to take care of some things. And he starts cleaning me up. He starts cleaning me up and getting me back on my feet. And when he's all done, he says, now, I want you to go tell the others who share your condition. You tell them what I did for you. You tell them what I did. Today, I'd love nothing more than to go straight into that Olympics and tell them, say, hey, the Jesus that you just mocked, He loves you. He loves you. And oh, how you'll regret this day if you don't get right with Him. Because church, that's our mission today. It's to go ye into all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, that they get right with the God Jehovah, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that they not be left behind when He returns. That is our mission. That is our calling. And that is our hope today. Each and every one of us here have family members who do not know Jesus Christ. Some of us here aren't where we need to be in Jesus Christ. Some of us have been talking a good game and living another. And it's time that we pick a side and follow Jesus Christ today and be changed forever. We can't play the church game and think that God will just always turn a blind eye. There's coming a day where He will hold us to account. And we've got to be ready. So today at this altar call, I ask you, are you ready to meet the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Are you ready to fall down at His feet and worship a God who loves you more than words? Today, whatever needs you have, whatever prayer you need to pray, for anything God has laid on your heart, I ask you to come to this altar and get it right with Him. Don't leave here and not do it. 
grab your wife. Wives, grab your husbands. Start building a marriage that this world cannot tear apart and pray at this altar. Parents, grab your kids. Grab your grandkids. Grab your babies. And come down here to the altar and pray with them. There is no more precious thing I do as a pastor than to pray with my kids, not only during the week, but at this altar. So whatever needs you have, whatever prayer you need to pray for anything that God has laid on your heart this morning, I invite you, this altar is open for any needs you have. Please come.